Today we're going to bring it a little closer to the table. So the entire book of Romans, the theme is street, home, and table. From chapter 1 to chapter 11, it's about Jesus, who was Jesus, who is Jesus, what about Jesus, how is he connected to Judaism or the Jews, what makes him the Messiah, how is he the savior of the world, can everyone be saved, the significance of Jesus relating to Abraham. And then, chapter 12, he, he flipped the switch on us and he said, what does that mean now for us? What does it mean for you to believe in Jesus? How do you live as Christian? How do you behave as Christians? How do you now uh, conduct yourself now that you know Jesus? So some of the questions we've been asking the last couple of weeks is how should I live? Where should my body look? Uh, how, where should I take my bodies? Where should I take my eyes? What should I do with my life and my resources? How do I handle relationship? If you remember last week, it was me and Kurt, this human being that I didn't realize how small I was until I sat next to him. And, um, you know, how do we handle relationship? And, and someone brought this to my attention at the end of service. Um, it is kind of hard to, to be mad at somebody when you sit that close to them, you know? Uh, it's really hard. So, so the trick to, to handle any type of conflicts at home is, is go and sit next to your wife as close as possible when she's mad at you. She can't be mad at you. You sit that close to her, you know, or, or any kind of relationship where you're in trouble or, or having a conflict with somebody. It's just trying to sit as close as possible to them. It's hard to be mad at somebody when they sit that close to, to you. So uh, all this uh, relationships, this different type of, of ways that Paul is telling us how to live now after we uh, know Jesus. And if you want to catch up on our teachings, it's always on YouTube, on our website as well. But today we're going to cover the table the table, Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Let's stand as we read God's word together. It's on the screen as well. Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block on or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it's unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat or, or you are no longer acting in love, do not, by your eating, destroying someone for whom Christ died, Therefore, do not let what you know is good to be spoken as of evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but the righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. The word of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. I heard a story of an ancient general who said uh, to his defeated enemy, I will destroy you. And then prepare for him a lavish feast. So he invited his enemy that he just defeated over to his kingdom and ate together. And during the meal, the enemy says, uh, I understood that after this meal... You are going to destroy me. True, the general replied. Have I not destroyed my enemy and made him my friend? True, have I not destroyed my enemy and made him my friend? Leading up to this passage, Paul is giving us this huge responsibility of Christian liberty and social responsibility as a Christian. If you are a Christian, a Bible-believing, following Jesus, your life should be a little bit different than those around you. Leading up to this passage of Scripture, Paul is giving us some very practical ideas and things to follow. New bodily behavior. My body used to sit in the bar all the way to 1 o'clock in the morning. Now I'm going to take my body at home because I have wife and kids at home. 
My body used to be stinky and dirty because I don't shower because I live by myself. He said, now take your body, take a shower, get a job, and go on a date. That's how Paul responds to this now that you know Jesus. Renew your mind. My mind used to think a certain way. Now my mind has to focus and think different because now I know Jesus. I used to be a part of team no sleep and team hustle and, and work all the time. Now my mind is renewed and God says, rest, remember me. Team no sleep is not healthy for you because you don't sleep. You get angry. And when you're angry, you're not yourself. Grab a sneaker bar, right? Love must be sincere. Do not repay evil with evil. Be generous with your resources. Do not give into drunkenness and pay your taxes. He brought that up in chapter 13 by submitting to your government. Pay your taxes. Now he's bringing it home to the most sacred place in your home. Last week we talked about the most iconic piece of furniture in the home is the couch. Today, there's no other place more sacred than this in your home. When it comes to relationship with one another or those outside of your home, there's no other sacred place when it comes to relationship in the home is the table. It's the table. It's rich. It's meaningful. It breaks down all barriers. It, it, it creates conversation. It, 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 it updates you on what's going on in your life, on your kids, on your children, on your wife, on your friends. You sit at the table and you begin to have questions and answers and conversations where it brings you together. We're at the table. You're no longer looking at one another as, as you're just a stranger. But the table, you look at each other as, uh, you're my friend and I'm getting to know you and I want to love you and I, I want to know everything about you. There's nowhere more sacred in the home than the table. Now, in context, Paul here is explaining uh, Christian liberty in Christ. There were Jews, you know, just a little bit of Bible background. There, there were Jews who became Christians, and there were Gentiles who became Christian, and both groups has a little bit of, 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 of uh, a conflict. That The Jews would say, well, uh, we can't eat that kind of meat because most of the meat that was sold on the street of Rome were meat offered to idols. And then the Jewish law said, you are not allowed to eat meat that was, has been offered to idols. So now we have Gentile Christians who just became Christian and start eating whatever they want, living it up. We're free. We're Christians. Now we can eat this, which is not wrong, right? And then for the Jews, they're not wrong either. But what's wrong is between the two of them, who was more spiritual, who was more mature, who has the upper hand, who is better than who. So they had this problem between them because the Jews says, you can't eat that. The Gentile Christians said, yes, we can. No, you can't. We're better than you. No, you're not better than you. Then what happened? They start to create different tables in their homes even. You sit over here because you're not good enough to sit with us. You sit over there because you're not good enough to sit with us. And they have the same problem in Corinth. First Corinth, First Corinth chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. Now about food sacrifice to idols. This was new for everybody. Remember, Christianity was new to everybody. That's why we have so much conflict in the first 100 years of Christianity, they had to figure this out. All of a sudden, Jesus came along and said, I'm the Messiah. Here are the things you can and can't do anymore. Here's the freedom you have. You are now a child of God. All these things people have to figure out. And does it match up with the Old Testament? So they had the same problem in Corinth. In Corinth, now about food sacrificed to idols, we, we know that we all possess as knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not let... Do not yet known as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idol, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world. And that there's no God but one. Basically, he went in to explain an idol is not. We all know there's only one God. So you made up statues. You made up things to, to worship. Even you offer food. I mean, Paul says to a Gentile, it means nothing. We all know it's nothing. It's just a brick put together in the shape of something, so we know it's nothing, but the point that he's making is that knowing the Bible does not make you better, or knowing the law doesn't make you better, 
or attending church every Sunday, which I encourage you guys all to attend church every Sunday because the Bible says don't give up meeting together. The point he's making is don't be spiritual arrogance. It does not make you better by knowing more, but if you know more, make sure you love better. That's the point Paul is making. The root of the problem is not food. It's not drinking. It's not social interaction. The point that he's pointing out to all of us Christians, today it's about you. It's about us, right? So you're visiting church, you're visiting church for the first time, right? And I'm not looking at you because I know you're visiting for church for the first time. It's so obvious, right? If you're visiting church for the first time, you're going to say, amen. That's how I feel about church people because this passage of scripture, it's about church folks. He says, the, the more you know the Bible, the more you attend church, the more you read, the more you worship, as you mature in Christ, it doesn't make you better. Paul is saying, I hope the more you know, the better you love. The better you love. The root of the problem is not the food or the drinking or the getting together. The, food of the, problem, the, the root of the problem is, is spiritual arrogance among Christians. Some of the Gentiles believer were, were looking down at the Jews and say, why are you still doing that? Jesus came, so you don't, you don't have to do that anymore. And some of the Jewish Christians would look at them and say, you're a sinner. Like, why, why would you eat that? Why would you do that? Shouldn't you know better? You, you, you should be like us because we're so much better than you because we know the Old Testament. We know the laws. And Paul says, if your brothers or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone from whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but if righteousness, but of righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. Spiritual arrogance. Those who view Christianity, Christian liberty, as evidence of this puff up superiority of, of, of your faith. Some, somehow we, we fill our table. Christians, I, 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 I'm not yelling at you. I just want to tell you in love, right, that, that your pastor is putting myself out there for you. We we fill our table with, with gossips and, and, and alliances and judgmental mindset of saying how horrible the world is. We look at the world and say, why are they doing that? Why is he doing that? Why is she dressing like that? Why is he acting that way? I, I can't believe he still struggles with that. They're so bad. They're so wrong. They don't belong here. I can't believe they don't know this verse and this chapter. And to be honest with you, I don't know every single verse and chapter in the Bible either. I have to Google it sometimes, right? Just to be honest. I, 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 sometimes I have conversations with other people. And they'll shout out, James 2.15. I'm like, I have no idea what James 2.15 said. <laughs> well, you're in the middle of a conversation and you know that higher puff up. And they don't do it intentionally to put me down. They just get excited. They just kind of expect it that I would know because I'm a pastor. That I would have the whole Bible memorized. I don't have the whole Bible memorized. Some, I can't even remember where to put an S in my sentences. I can't have this memorized, okay? I, I listen to my sermon every Sunday. Right? Like this past Sunday, I, I listened to it for my improvement in academia purposes. And I want to learn the way I speak in my, you know, my little quirks and stuff like that. And I realized how poor my grammar was last week in my sermon. <laughs> Was, when I listen to my sermon, I can, I can see it. I can hear it. But as I'm going with you, I, I, can't, I can't figure it out. So anyways, uh, there, there's this, it's somehow in our Christian journey, I, I want you to know, somehow in our Christian journey, we forget that we're supposed to make disciples. And not shoot down or drive away disciples. There's nothing worse in the world than Christian being arrogant about our faith. 
We, we rank our sins. We, we view someone else's sin as, as way better or, or way worse than our own. We even justify and, and rationalize our own sin, refusing to show others grace the same way we show ourselves grace. We surround, surround ourselves with self-righteous believers who, who loves to tell people what to do or tell churches what to do or, or tell even pastors, sometimes myself, what to do. Like, you should do this at your church. Well, you don't go to my church. Why, 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 why would I do that at our church? Well, you don't go to our church. We're doing things at our church because I love Jesse Brewster, right? Like, that's why we do things here the way we do things here. We behave like the older brothers in, in the story of the prodigal son. And if you're visiting church with us for the first time, you might not know who the prodigal son is. But like I said, the sermon today is for us Christians. Sometimes we behave like the, the, the older brother. Why? How can, you, how can you love someone like that? How can you come to church looking like that? How do you not know the Bible? I can't believe you don't go here. I can't believe you don't do this. I can't believe you're still doing that. God don't love you. You need to be a part of this. You need to be a part of this club to that group. And what I love about Palm Sunday is Jesus saw the problem at the table, the most sacred place in our home, through a series of events. And he began with a triumphal entry, what we call it Palm Sunday. Leaving Romans, turn to Matthew chapter 21. You have your Bibles a couple pages back. There are four Gospels. Where are they? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Very good. There's two parts of the Bible. The New Testament. The first book of the Bible is Genesis. The last book is Revelation. Awesome. So right after Easter, you see these curtains here? Uh, we have a pretty cool Easter uh, service plan. And after Easter, we're going to go through the, the book of Revelation. So make sure you join us for that. Um, some decorations beginning to go up. Matthew 21, a very large crowd spreading their clothes on the row while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the row. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that follow shouted, Hosanna, the son of David. Blesses the one Blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The word Hosanna, as, as David Paltonovich beautifully explained, I don't need to go through that again. You already heard it. Is the word save us, save us. You are our king. You are here to save us. They were thinking he's going to save them from Rome. And John went into even more specific chapter 12. You don't have to turn there. They took palm branches. And went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. So that's why we have palm branches. The significance of this was, was, was a sign of victory. He's riding on a donkey. In short, a couple minutes here. He's riding on a donkey. Signifies peace. And palm branches or leaves or, or clothes on the ground is to welcome home a victorious king. Jesus hasn't been in battle yet. He's just entering into Jerusalem. He hasn't went on to the Romans Praetorium yet. But yet they were celebrating Jesus as, like, as, as victorious already. You know how I mentioned the story of Jesus? In order for it to make sense, everything has to match up. Well, this is one of those things, right? Jesus already defeated. But he wasn't defeating Rome. He was defeating sin. So he arrived into Jerusalem. Everything, everyone thought that he was going to overthrow Rome. He's going to bring Judaism back to his glory like King David. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of the Jews hated Jesus because he was gaining so much followers. And people were worshiping him, were following him. So he's entering to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they wave and they put it on the ground. They say, Hosanna, save us, save us from Rome. Save us, save us. And, then, and they throw it on the ground as a Jesus ride across. It's a sign of victory. But this was also an Old Testament law. In Leviticus chapter 23, on the first day, can you bring that up on the screen, Josh? On the first day, you are to take branches from a luxuriant tree. I had to Google that, and it's, it's a type of tree that grows a lot of leaves. Willows and other leafy trees. So it's not always palm branches. And rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Celebrate this as a new festival to the Lord for seven days each year. 
This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seventh month. Live in temporary shelters for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in such shelters so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. The big, the big idea here is, is there he's saying, build yourself a temporary shelter to remember that I brought you out of slavery, that you were free from the Egyptians. So the expectation when Jesus entered into Jerusalem was a little different than what God had in mind. They were, they were expecting Jesus would, would gather an army of people. They were expecting of, of all the men going to pick up their uh, whatever weapons they had back then, pitchforks and and rakes and sticks and start doing push-ups and running miles, built a couple of six-packs and broad shoulders, the bodies becoming like a Greek god, and ready to fight and defeat Rome the way the Hebrew people defeated Egypt. But Jesus did just the opposite. He did something that, that none of us would ever expect it. I had a table right here. Oh, here it is. Thank you. Can you help me put it up? So, so they, they were thinking that Jesus is going to gather an army and people are just going to volunteer and start doing sit-ups and push-ups and running miles to get in shape to defeat Rome. They were looking for some six-packs, broad shoulders, tattoos, just me, like, like that guy, look at that. Just mean looking, you know, ready to go to fight in battle. But Jesus did just the opposite. He set up a table. And it's his table. He had Judas, who, who kind of know Jesus, but didn't really understand Jesus, but was, was very greedy. And at the other end of the table, he has Matthew, who is a tax collector, who, was, who has been cheating the people for, for all his life, right? And he has Peter, who was really reckless, like Peter was the, one of those guys who was the first to do everything. Like he denied Jesus and, and very reckless in his faith. But then God used him as well. And Bartholomew and all those guys were sitting all around the table. And then it, it illustrated that John, who was really young in his faith. John was the brother of James, who was really young. And then Jesus loved John. So he, the, the, the scripture described John sat next to Jesus. So Jesus loves John because he was young and, and, and he didn't really know it all. So, so, and then when Jesus set up his table, he, he had Judas who betrayed him. And then, and then Peter who was reckless. And then John who was very young in his faith. And then Matthew who, who cheated the people all his life. Who didn't pay, uh, you know, work for Rome and collecting taxes on the street. And one for you and two for me and one for you and three for me type of thing. And, and, and a bunch of fishermen just sitting around. Very unfit very somewhat just ordinary people who probably didn't really get along with each other some, right? I, or sometimes they, they would get in arguments like, oh, God, who's going to sit next to you in heaven? Right? They, they would have arguments. Jesus, who, who would get to go first? <laughs> Jesus, uh, can, we, we, can we do that too? And Jesus would often say, calm down <laughs> one day. Not yet. Not yet. And, then, and Judas ended up betraying him. And through the series event, Jesus taught them how to live. He says, I want you to love one another. I want you to pray for one another. And, and he says, in this world, you're going to have trouble because uh, they're going to reject you the way they rejected me. So expect that. So for mature Christians in this room, Christianity is going to be persecuted. I don't know if you know it. It's biblical. You're not the most popular person in the crowd when you start to talk about Jesus. I don't know you know, it, it, is, it is prophecy coming, revealing right in front of us right now. Last week I watched the news, as I often do, a church in China in the middle of service. The government went in and, and tore it down and arrested people, killing a couple, simply because they were having church worship service. I have a friend in India 
who, who every time he speaks, the government would put a gun at his head and he says, if you excite the crowd, we're going to shoot you on the spot. He's been preaching to the, in India for the last 20 years, run one of the biggest missionary organizations in India. But every time he speaks, they would, the government would be right there and say, if you excite the crowd, we will shoot you on the spot. And here in our homeland, we're not the most popular people in the crowd, are we, anymore? Yeah, we still have our spiritual freedom, but doesn't everybody? But when you talk about Christ, it's almost like you're the judgmental one. You're the wrong one. You're the, you're the bigot. You're the hater. You're, no, we're just following God's word, what God really intended for all of us all along. So at the table of Jesus, he starts to teach, and he says, love one another, and, and you're going to be persecuted, but, but I have overcome the world, and I'm going to come back and take you with me because I'm going to the Father's house, and I'm going to build you a house, and we're all going to be there one day. And, and he, he illustrated to us the best way he knows how in an earthly picture. I'm not sure if there would be homes in heaven, but I'm sure it would be better than what we have here. And he began to wash their feet. What's agonizing about the this, this scene that Jesus washed the disciples' feet is that he washes Judas' feet, who actually betrayed him, who actually uh, took the money and said, that, Jesus, go arrest him, right? And then he washed Matthew's feet, who has been cheating all the people in Jerusalem all his life. Right? And then he washed uh, Peter's feet, who was reckless. And, and Peter was actually the one that's, that, that told the crowd, says, I, I, don't, I don't know that man. When the crowd says, hey, aren't you the, the Peter that was following one of his disciples? And, and Peter says, no, I don't know that man. And then he washed John's feet, who was young in his faith, who didn't know a whole lot, who probably can quote a couple of passages of scripture. Right? And he washed his feet as well. So, so the way that Jesus solved the problem with our table what, that fills with gossips and slanders and judgmental and, oh, you're not good enough to sit here and you don't know the Bible enough. Why do you dress that way? Why do you, sh- you don't know the Bible enough. You should, you should read the Bible the, from front to back in a whole year and blah, all these standards we put on people that, w- that we can't even meet ourselves, right? And, and Jesus solved that problem by washing all their feet and he, he gathered the table because at the center of Jesus' table where Palm Sunday, when he walks into that city, is he says, I defeated that for you. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to be so cruel and mean. You don't have to be self-righteous because I love you the same way I love him and I love you the same way I love her. Because that's when I come to your home, the victory, it's not me defeating some kind of person that you don't like. The victory is I'm defeating the sin that's in you. Sometimes us, we want other people to suffer because they hurt us. Remember last week I talked about hurting people hurts people? Sometimes we want Jesus to hurt them, but Jesus, no, I'm, I'm not going to hurt them. I love them the same way I love you. What I am going to solve is your heart. Because you know more, now you can love better. So it's ingenious the way Jesus set it up to solve this problem. So I went to Bible college right out of high school. 17 years old, graduate high school early. Yes, I was that smart. I graduated high school early, 17 years old. What good can come from Idaho anyways? A lot of what? Hearts, a lot of hearts. <laughs> potato, do you bring potatoes with it? Is that pot- potatoes in Idaho? <laughs> Please come back, I know. So I went to Bible college right out of 17 years old. I got on campus. I was not the most popular guy in the room. Not because I was doing anything wrong. It's a Bible college. There were a lot of older, bigger brothers there, you know what I mean, from the story of the prodigal son. I often heard, why is new here? Uh, he, he should go back to Florida and go to that FAU across the street. This is a Bible college. Why does he behave that way? He's listening to Tupac. For goodness sake, that's the only thing I knew growing up out of high school, right? This is Bible. Why is he here? And I started dating Liz, right? And people <laughs> were writing notes to Liz. 
that she should break up with me because I was simply not mature enough as a Christian or good enough for her. You just heard my wife mention Jesus like a piece of chicken nuggets. That's delicious, right? Just so you know where our maturity are, right? So, so there, were, there were a bunch of bigger brothers, right, looking at me like I wasn't worthy or good enough to be at Bible college. But, man, I, I, I had just became a Christian. <laughs> I didn't know the Bible the way you knew the Bible. But how about you take me in and teach me what this thing is talking about? And sometimes in our Christian walk, we forget that we were supposed to make disciples and teach this. We take this and we thump it on people's head and say, you should know this. Well, how can I know this? I don't know what it's talking about. And God says, now that you know more, you should love better. Love is, love is patient. Love is, is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always persevere. And those of you who have been married for a long time, love never fails. That's not just for weddings. That's for us to live as a Christian. I hope you come to this church and doesn't feel like you don't know enough or you don't dress well enough or you don't go to church. I hope you walk through these doors every Sunday knowing you're here to worship God and worship God only because at his table, you might not know enough, but man, you're trying. You don't have your life all together. But, man, you're trying to make it through, don't you? And you don't have all the world's problems solved, but, man, you're giving, you're serving, you're doing whatever you can on your end. Because at the Lord's table, he only cares that your heart loves bigger, not what you know, but that your heart loves bigger. Because now you know. So I heard a story of an old, ancient general. Who says to his defeated enemy, I will destroy you? And then prepare a lavish meal for him. He invite him over. They had the meal, some of the best food. And the enemy who has just been destroyed, obviously in fear, probably thinking that this is my last meal. But I have to ask. He leans over and he says, I heard you're going to destroy me. And the general said, true. Have I not destroyed my enemy and made him my friend? In each one of you, I received this from the kids. And we did that on purpose. Because as, as you as adults, you welcome Jesus into your homes. These kids are the ones that's going to need you to love bigger. Because they don't know. They're going to mess up. But some of these kids are going to do things that's going to disappoint us and going to hurt us dearly. And some of them are your children. And they need you. They, they, they need you to be strong in the word. They need you to welcome Jesus into your homes. Not defeat at the enemy, but defeat at your own heart of spiritual arrogance. Your own heart of maturity. Your own heart of knowing the scripture. Your own heart that you think the world is so bad, but realize in your heart, maybe I need to change something about me as well. Hold this up. On Easter Sunday, we're going to give you something. 
the shape of a cross, but made out of palm branches as well. And you're going to take it home, and you're going to attach it to this. You can put this anywhere in your home. As a constant reminder that the story of Palm Sunday is not about defeating your enemy like Rome or those you don't like or those who've been hurting you or persecute you. But the, but the story of Palm Sunday is, is Jesus defeated sin in your life, in your own heart, that you now you know better. So the nation of Israel would make these temporary shelters to live in it as a reminder that I have defeated sin in your life. You are now a people of God. So you take this and you, you put on your table or your door post inside. As you walk through it every single day, you realize you are under God's grace as well. So the nation of Israel take this very seriously. And they take this blessing. In Deuteronomy, and they say this to each other, as I say to you, as I bless you and as I bless your family, and he says, may the Lord bless you. Make his face shine upon you. And may him give you peace wherever you go. Amen.